these families. Thank you. We now move to top of questions. Question one, Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will make a statement on the resignation of the convener of the Crofting Commission. Minister Eileen MacLeod. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I also um, thank Tavish Scott for bringing forward this uh, topical question this afternoon. Susan Walker stepped down as Commissioner and convener of the Crofting Commission on the 8th of May after three years in post. And in that time, she led the Commission through a period of transformational change. Can I also, just presenting officer, just take this moment just to put on record my sincere thanks and appreciation to Susan Walker for all of her hard work and for making such a positive contribution to crofting during her time as Commissioner and Convener. I mean, for the first time I met Susan shortly after I was appointed crofting minister, I have been impressed by her vision and passion for crofting and Scotland's crofting communities, as well as her expertise and her many achievements since taking office, which includes a comprehensive review of crofting commission policies and procedures working tirelessly to raise the profile of the crofting commission and her positive contribution to Scottish government policymaking on crofting. I have written to the Rural Affairs Committee following Mrs Walker's decision to step down and I will be meeting with the Commission on the 22nd of May uh, to discuss options and next steps for filling the vacancies of convener and commissioner that now exist. Tavish Scott. Uh, thank you. Can I thank the Minister for that uh, reply? Uh, would the Minister now accept that a couple of things have to happen as a result of the Commission convener resigning, which has simply never happened in the past before? Firstly, the Government should accept a nomination for Commission convener based on the crofting commissioners choosing one of their own to be the convener. And secondly, that the Commission should drop a one-size-fits-all approach to crofting regulation and instead implement an approach based on sensible plans for the different crofting counties, allowing decrofting so crofters can borrow money for their businesses on the assets of their croft. Would the Minister undertake to take both of those matters forward? Minister. Um, can I uh, thank Tavish Scott for his supplementary? Both, both of Susan Walker's roles uh, were appointed, but in the spirit of being constructive and collaborative, I'm open uh, to discussing options with the commissioners in the first instance, obviously with our meeting uh, next week, but also with colleagues in this chamber and through further correspondence with the RACI committee. I'm also happy to continue discussions with Tavish Scott further to our previous discussions when we met on the 23rd of April together with his colleague Lee MacArthur. Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'm grateful to the Minister for that approach, and I welcome it, and it is uh, constructive and what is uh, needed. Would she accept that Susan Walker had the impossible task of implementing the 2010 Crofting Act, which simply has not worked in the eyes of crofters, and has already meant that the Government has had to introduce and indeed rush through emergency legislation? Would she therefore undertake uh, to work with crofting assessors, the Crofting Foundation, and indeed crofters across the crofting counties to ensure that agriculture and land land use uh, are what we're trying to achieve rather than, rather than lawyers, bureaucrats and the Scottish Land Court. Minister. Um, to be short, um, presenting officer, absolutely I'll be very happy to do so. Rob Gibson. Thank you. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I uh, note that the uh, Chief Executive of the Scottish Crofting Federation, the representative body for crofters, has said that uh, it's not about democratic legitimacy of the ex-convener uh, and indeed that they had worked very well with the ex-convener uh, of the Crofting Commission. Uh, and that also he said that it was a big enough job dealing with the, the legacy that the commissioners had to face rather than washing dirty linen in public. Minister, I wonder if you could tell us what steps you will take to ensure that moves to modernise crofting under Susan Walker's excellent but frustrated leadership will be continued. Minister. Well, as Rob Gibson acknowledges, I mean, Susan Walker made a very valued and lasting contribution to the Commission in Crofting in Scotland. She led the Commission through a period of transformational change and has helped to build strong foundations on which the organisation will now move forward. I look forward to meeting with the Commission next week and to discussing the opportunities and the work ahead. As I said to the member in my letter uh, to his committee, Although the legislation enables ministers in respect of both vacancies to select and appoint 
and new Commissioner and Convener, I want to take a considered and consultative approach to filling these vacancies and believe that we really do have an opportunity to further improve the Commission's operation, transparency and accountability. And I want to engage with the Commission and in due course with the Raki Committee in this process. And I'm very happy to keep the Parliament fully informed as well. Rosa Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I also uh, thank Susan Walker for being certainly very constructive with her dealings with me. Um, can, but can I agree with Tavish Scott that the Commissioners should be allowed to appoint their own chair? Certainly concerns have been raised with me that the Minister has not met with the other Commissioners since her own appointment, and I'm glad that in her previous answer she said she is going to put that right and meet with them next week. But should she have done that sooner in order to listen to their concerns and indeed deal with the problems they arose before we reach this situation. Minister. Uh, in my uh, reply, can I uh, say that I actually I met with um, Susan Walker on the 28th of uh, January this year when uh, we met to discuss the Crofting Commission and later the same day I also had a meeting with the Government's Crofting Stakeholder Forum. I also met with the Scottish Crofting Federation uh, on the 11th of March, as well as a meeting with the cross-party group on crofting. Officials actually contacted uh, the Commission at my request on the 15th of January to arrange a meeting uh, for May, and this initiated a suggestion to change the date of the Commission's board meeting away from the 13th of May to a date that we could make. So the date is next Friday for the meeting with the Commissioners, and I'm very much looking forward to meeting with the Commissioners next Friday. Jamie McGregor. Uh, thank you. Um, as convener of the cross-party group on crofting, I also wish to thank Susan Walker for her service and hard work and thank her for her regular attendance at the cross-party crofting group. Uh, does the minister agree that the most democratic way forward and one that has crofters' support would be for elected commissioners to determine Susan Walker's replacement? And would she agree also that a replacement for Susan Walker should be decided on as soon as possible so that the Crofting Commission avoids any period of uncertainty and instead can focus on its key role of regulating, and not only regulating, but actually supporting our crofters. Minister. No, I would agree with that. And I would also point out, obviously, to Jimmy Gregor, and just to reiterate uh, what I've also said in both the letter to the Raki Committee and also to members across this uh, chamber, that I am obviously meeting with the Commissioners uh, next Friday, and I'm very open to discussing options with the Commissioners in the first instance, but obviously with colleagues across the Chamber and in further correspondence with the Racket Committee. And as I've said previously, I'm very keen and happy to keep the Parliament fully informed of those discussions. Question two, Mark MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the implications for Scotland would be of the abolition of the Human Rights Act by the UK Government. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government's position is that implementation of the Conservative Government's proposals would require legislative consent and that this Parliament should make clear that such consent will not be given. On the 11th of November last year, this Parliament passed a motion in support of the Human Rights Act by a majority of 100 to 10. There is currently insufficient detail in what is proposed to predict the impact on Scotland with any certainty. However, given the almost unanimous opposition in this Parliament and among Scottish MPs at Westminster, it would remain open to exclude Scotland from legislation to repeal the Human Rights Act or for the Scottish Government to pass legislation to give effect to a range of rights and policy areas which are within devolved competence. If the UK Government were to follow through on its rights to withdraw from the European Convention on Human Rights, people in Scotland would no longer be able to take cases to the European Court of Human Rights. The ECHR is the world's most successful human rights treaty and has been hugely influential around the world. I think it's incumbent on this Parliament to send a clear message that these proposals are unacceptable and will not receive our support. Mark MacDonald. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for his comprehensive answer. Um, given that in 2013, the percentage of cases in, Stras in which Strasbourg ruled against the UK totaled a measly 0.48%, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that what we are seeing here is a case that is built on sand uh, and is actually extremely dangerous posturing by this Conservative government? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, Presiding Officer, we believe as a Scottish Government that the European Court of Human Rights fulfils an essential function as part of the ECHR system. 
It is essential that citizens have the right to petition the Strasbourg Court where they feel their rights have been breached. The statistics demonstrate that rulings against the UK are comparatively rare, which is not reflected in some of the rhetoric we see around this issue. Mark MacDonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. The Cabinet Secretary has also highlighted that he considers that this chamber would need to be uh, asked to give consent uh, through legislative consent motions uh, and also that he would be minded to recommend that we refuse such consent. Has he received any indication as yet from the UK Government that they would seek consent from this chamber via legislative consent motions at this stage? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, we haven't received any information about the intentions of the UK Government. Obviously, the Queen's speech will uh, take place in uh, the next two weeks or so, and hopefully uh, in or around the Queen's speech we'll get more details of what this, the Conservative Government proposes. Clear Baker. Thank you, President Officer. Um, there is not a case for abolition, and I firmly believe the Human Rights Act should stay. It is appalling that one of the first acts of this Conservative Government is to abolish the Human Rights Act and to attempt to leave the ECHR. Um, but like many of their policies, this is ideology and rhetoric being put above the actual practicalities and impact of delivering a policy. Um, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary how he plans to keep this chamber informed of any discussions he has with the UK Government? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, presiding officer, I'm happy to give such an undertaking. I think, as I referred to in my first answer, in November last year, this parliament voted on this very issue. And I think, with the exception of the Conservative benches, we were united in terms of our opposition to the scrapping of this legislation or withdrawal from the European Convention. And I'm very happy to keep the parliament informed as and when I have information to give to the parliament. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. It's my understanding, and perhaps the Cabinet Secretary could uh, explain whether, his government, whether the government agrees with this, that if the Tories, who I see haven't bothered to turn up to defend their position, scrap the Human Rights Act without withdrawal from the ECHR, and the other uh, signatories to that convention accept that position, they may not need a legislative consent motion. That consent would be needed for withdrawal from the convention, but not necessarily for the scrapping of the Human Rights Act itself. This would give rise not just to fragmentation within the different parts of the UK, but even within Scotland. Police Scotland, for example, would be subject to a different rights regime if they were dealing with devolved criminal justice matters as opposed to reserved drugs and terrorism matters. Is that an accurate description of the situation, particularly in relation to legislative consent? Presiding officer, rather than uh, try and speculate, I think it would be better to wait to see exactly what the precise proposal is, and then I can give a more precise reply to Patrick Havery, because this goes beyond the powers and the legislation setting up this parliament. For example, the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland has built into it ECHR requirements, and therefore this is a matter that affects not just Scotland and the Scottish Parliament, it affects very clearly, in particular, Northern Ireland and the Stormont Parliament, but it also affects people in England as well as people in Wales and the Welsh Assembly as well. So I'm happy to give a specific answer to that question once I see the detail of what is actually proposed. Neil Findlay. Yeah. President officer, I congratulate the new MPs entering the UK Parliament this week, but I hope that the, the very understandable euphoria of Scotland's new batch of SNP MPs is curtailed somewhat because the plans to get rid of the Human Rights Act is no doubt just one in a long, long list of policies that will see the new Tory government attack the young, the old, the weak, the vulnerable, and of course migrants and trade unions. So does the Minister agree with me that in, in fearing for the future of the rights of ordinary working people across the UK? And does he think that this is just the first grenade being lobbed in which is going to be a very bloody assault? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, uh, I agree in general terms with what Neil Finlay is saying. It's very clear from a whole range of policy pronouncements that have already been made in relation to a range of issues like welfare cuts that very clearly the prospect of some of the legislation and measures being proposed by the new Conservative government 
give a lot of cause of, for concern, particularly for the more vulnerable members of our community. But in terms of human rights, we are all vulnerable, irrespective of our social status or our economic status. Human rights is a fundamental that affects every individual in our society. And we in this parliament and right across the United Kingdom, including, I believe, some Tory MPs, will be very concerned about any dilution of the human rights legislation in this country. Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, does the Minister consider that there's an opportunity here to sort out some of the not inconsiderable problems that have arisen from the incorporation of ECR, ECHR directly into Scots um, law um, via the Scotland Act 1990, uh, 1988? And this is demonstrated by the Cadder ruling uh, uh, when the, the, the consequences haven't been fully appreciated. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, I don't think when you're looking at a system of law you can decide on the basis of some rulings you like or don't like that you then tear up the whole thing. You know, the whole point of rule of law, I think many of us probably from the week to week see judgments made in the courts that we might not agree with, but that's not an excuse to get rid of the court system. I think it's a fundamental point that our human rights are protected under ECHR. As Mark MacDonald pointed out, uh, the ECHR has played a vital role in upholding the rights of individuals and organisations. And I think it would be a sad day if we were to tear up our membership of the ECHR or in any way try to dilute the legislation and the protection that exists in the Scotland Act and in various other legislation that cross-references the ECHR is a fundamental a framework for the protection of human rights in our country. Thank you. That ends topical question time. We now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 13107, in the name of Michael Matheson, on the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Bill. Can I...